Okay, we're here in Washington, D.C. at the Selling Sickness Conference. And I have with us today Dr. Jeremy Gruber, who is the co-author with Sheldon Krimsky of Genetic Explanations, Sense and Nonsense. Um, Dr. Gruber, I wonder if you could tell us what motivated you to write this book? Sure, thank you. This book uh, is a project of the Council for Responsible Genetics. Uh, and this book began as an effort uh, to try to counter a lot of the misinformation and exaggeration about uh, the effects of genomics in a wide variety of disciplines uh, from psychiatry and psychology um, to uh, different areas uh, of human biology to forensics um, all the way through uh, priorities for research funding. So we're really trying uh, through this book and we have a number of authors uh, who've contributed to this book uh, we're really trying to dispel a lot of the mythology that continues uh, to be perpetuated about the power of the genome uh, and uh, try to, to level the field a little bit and bring a better, much better understanding of where the world of genomic science is now and role it actually plays in human health. And can you give us uh, an example or two of what some of these myths are about genes and genetics? Well, a, a lot of the mythology around genetics uh, uh, revolves around a lot of the reductionist thinking uh, that was perpetuated uh, really at the very beginning of the genomic movement and that continues to saddle that movement today. Um, that uh, the genes uh, have associations to particular traits and to particular behaviors. Um, and that's in most cases really not the case. Uh, the truth is, is that genes are really part of a complex ecosystem. Uh, and we're just beginning to learn about gene-gene interactions, uh, about gene-environment interactions, and about really the complexity uh, that is human biology, of which the genome is a very small part. And that seems to be a really difficult message to get across to the sort of general public. And do you have any sense of why that is difficult? Well, genetics has become so much a part of the social discourse that we now talk about DNA uh, as a metaphor just for just about anything immutable. Um, and you can't turn on the TV without watching an episode of CSI. Uh, you can't pick up a newspaper without seeing a headline for a new discovery uh, in the world of genomics. And yet, anybody who's been to the doctor lately uh, will know that in most cases, the world of genomics has really not manifested itself in clinical care uh, because the, the movement from correlation to causation has been very, very slow. And is there anything that a, an individual consumer uh, who's kind of on the receiving end of some of these messages about the power of genes can do to kind of become more informed? Well, I think uh, they need to become more informed uh, and, well, hopefully read genetic explanations. But, you know, the truth is, is that science education in this country run genetics is very, very poor. Most adults in this country uh, came of age when genetics wasn't even part of the curricula, uh, and uh, and even for those students still uh, coming up through the system now, uh, genetics education has been relatively poor looking at binary traits like eye and hair color. Uh, the genetics of disease, the genetics of complex disorders um, is something that most uh, people know uh, almost nothing about and are very susceptible to the suggestions that are being made uh, that uh, we can be deconstructed uh, so simplistically by our genome. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.